Jeremiah chapter 45. The word that came to Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch the son of Neriah. When he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah. So the writer of the book of Jeremiah, at least most of it, is Baruch. And Baruch wrote at what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah dictated as Baruch wrote. And people will say, well, you know, men wrote the Bible. There it is. Men wrote the Bible. But the inspiration wasn't Baruch. It was Jeremiah. And we read many times. Thus saith the Lord came unto Jeremiah. The words of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah. Thus saith the Lord. Like verse 2. God spoke to Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke to Baruch. And we have the book of Jeremiah written to us. And we've seen early in, in Jeremiah where a scroll was written and burnt. And Jeremiah, through God, spoke to Baruch, rewrit the script and the scroll, and there were words added too. Now, I get all the time in a public ministry, you know, men wrote the Bible like, I'm supposed to pack it up, go home, and quit. And I tell them, yeah, you're right. Men wrote the Bible. The pen is man and the ink is the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah, Baruch, David, Moses, Paul, and Paul had writers for him. These weren't men of the world. They sat down, okay, what am I going to do? It was a dark and cloudy night. It was a stormy night. It was a beautiful thing. These are, they didn't sit down and do that. The writings of the Bible and the Word of God are not the writings of man. It's the writings of God. And there are writings like the book of Psalms where a man sat down and he wrote inspiration poem or a song to God. And God said, hey, you know what? I like that. And I inspired that to be in the Word of God. Listen, of all the things that David wrote, Samuel, Psalm, there was a lot more things he wrote that are not recorded. There are things that Jeremiah and Baruch had not recorded. Even John tells us at the end of this gospel, there are many, many, much things that the world can't handle what Jesus done. And here's a case, if anybody ever wants, well, men wrote the Bible. All right, yeah, Baruch wrote the Bible. But you got to exclude Jeremiah. you got to exclude God. But here's the book of the mouth of Jeremiah. This is the book of Jeremiah we've been studying. The book of Job, you realize, is written by, um, I just had his name on the tip of my tongue and it went away. Man is the pen, the Holy Spirit is the ink. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying. So, we're at the point here now, and chapters in Jeremiah are out of order. The last king is Zedekiah. We are reading the chapter where Jerusalem and Judah has not been conquered. God's still warning them. The Babylonian army has not destroyed. And yet God said, for whatever reason, God, I don't know, put this chapter 45 afterwards. Why? I don't know. And one mistake you, you got, we'll read in the Bible is, all right, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, well, that's got to be in order. It's not. Why did God do that? God said, The study has shown thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be shamed, rightly divine the word. We've got to go in the Bible and read. And one of the things that may make us in error of the Bible is we think it's in order. And it may not be. 
You got this rightly put in order. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch. So God is speaking now to Baruch through Jeremiah. And Baruch is writing what God told Jeremiah. And Baruch is putting it down in paper. Thou did say, okay, verse 3. Okay, let's let's get this, let's get this down. God is speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is speaking to Baruch. Baruch's got the pen in hand. Verse 3 is what with what is what Baruch said. So God is quoting Baruch, telling Jeremiah, as Baruch writes down, and he's going to write down what God recorded to Jeremiah what Baruch said. say, well, I don't read the Old Testament. I don't. Don't you get the idea that God gets every word you know? Jesus said, every idle word man shall give an account. Here by Ruth, he's being quoted by God to Jeremiah, and he's got to write down what he said to God, and we don't know if he said it to Jeremiah or he said it out loud. That Christians need to learn that one of the things we must if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We've got to learn two things about confession. We've got to confess our big mouth. And the Apostle James gives a whole chapter about the tongue. And then we got to confess our thought life. Because our thoughts are sin. Our mouth is sin. Uh, you know, people say, I've had it a couple times, not often, but I've never killed anybody. Have you ever told any? when I grew up, the expression was drop dead. That, that, I haven't heard that expression recently, but have you ever told anybody to drop dead? Well, you want them dead. That's murder. Have you thought in your head uh, ways, and, oh, I can just get revenge. I can just take over. That's murder. Just as much as a man looks upon a woman and lusts after her in his heart. That's adultery. So what we learn from verse 3 is what Baruch said, God heard in God's recording. And he's writing it in a book. And God right now, I believe in heaven, I believe there's a book with every man's name in it. And it begins at birth. And everything that we do from birth, happy birthday to you, is recorded in that book. I believe God records date, and time, and second. That's why people don't like reading Chronicles. That's why they don't like to read the book of Numbers. But God's keeping an active book of our lives. And those pages will hold form at the Great White Throne Judgment. Unless in that book it will be recorded a day of the new birth. Being born again. And that day, if it's happened in your life and you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That date will be recorded in that book. The angels rejoice. It's, I think Luke chapter 16 is it? Luke 16. Luke 15 Verse 15 Luke 15 10 I say unto you there is joy in the presence of angels of God of God who over one sinner that repented. In verse 7, I say unto you, there is likewise joy in being in heaven over one sinner that repented. And that moment of repentance is when it brings forth a name being written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. That Lamb's Book of Life is somewhere up in heaven. And when, when, when whoever goes over and starts writing about all the hosts of angels, all the angels and all the hosts, same people, 
I remember in September of 2010, I told my daughter she got she got saved a week after her mom died. I said, your mom knows now. And I told her, I showed her the scripture. The angels were rejoicing when you got saved, and then all the hosts of heaven. Someone wrote your name down, and I don't know how it happened, but, you know, a loved one in heaven, what's the commotion, what's going on? Someone got saved. Wow. And they take a peek in that man's book of life and say, hey, that's my daughter. That's my husband. That's my son. That's my schoolmate. God's a recorder of a book in the book. And then from the day that you you say born again, everything going back to your birthday, your old birth to your new birth has been all erased and washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why it's wrong for Christians to happy birthday. You're born into sin. The new birth, everything going back to the old birth, the born of the flesh, born of the... That's washed. It's the new birth that sets you free. You want to celebrate a birthday, celebrate the new birth. And I had a pastor tell me one, well, you know, not many people don't remember the day they were saved. Shame, shame, shame on you for not telling them. Everybody I got, they, they can see that I'm witnessing to. I will write it down. I will tell them, do mark this day. And if I end up giving them a Bible, I will write in that Bible that day. I said, this is your new birthday. This is the day you're a new creature. And everything's being recorded in a book. And look, 2021, we are going to read the words of Baruch. There they are. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. There it is. Those words are going to be in heaven. For the Christian, if it's under the blood, I don't know what happens truly with all with an Old Testament saying. This, th thou didst say, thou is Baruch. Chapter 45, verse 3. God is going to quote Baruch. Woe is me now. And Baruch's been traveling with Jeremiah, and there's been troubles there from problem. Jeremiah's been cussed at, he's been yelled at. I don't know if he's been in prison yet, I don't think so. There's just troubles and problems, everything to do with Jeremiah's ministry. And Baruch's like, oh, woe is me. What have I got myself into? And I almost get to the point that, you know, Baruch and Jeremiah are, are together and all that. And Jeremiah opens, is about to open his mouth. Oh, no. Every time that boy opens his mouth in the public, we get into trouble. Remember, there's, there's only the Ethiopian union and Baruch, the really ones that we see are with Jeremiah. Except the Babylonian Chaldean army commander. And we know later on that there were Jews that finally listened to, to uh, Jeremiah. All right, we give up and surrender. And then you had the Ishmael coup, and then you had the Jonathan coup. And my room's like, Whew. I've had many Christians like that, and they left. They're no more with me. Baruch stayed with him. Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I'm in sorrow. I'm in. And God has added grief more. It's gotten worse. Baruch would walk up to a promise keeper, a prosperity preacher, and kick him in the shin. You couldn't tell Baruch and Paul about the prosperity gospel. And that's the difference between the gospels and the Christian life. All the promises that Jesus makes to the Jews, Paul had quite opposite. You know, food and raiment. And Paul said there was times he was naked. Paul said there was times he was starving. 
Either Jesus lied in the Gospels or Paul was out of faith or you got to rightly divide and the Gospels are not for the Christian. Now you can spiritually apply in the Bible, but spiritual is not always doctrinal and doctrinal is not always spiritual. Now I'll hear messages now, it's like they'll be using something out of God. Well, he's spiritually applying it. But doctrinally, you got to be careful. So look at the condition. Baruch, he's in sorrow. They call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. Baruch is not happy with the companion of Jeremiah. And God, God, you made grief. You made it worse. It, it'd be like you have a loved one there in the hospital. And you just, uh, it's just miserable. And then they die. That would be the grief. I, I fainted. In my sign. Oh. And it faded. And I find no rest. I like I like that for your for your ministry call. You call you call the deacon of your church. I'm talking about a good Christian, a good preacher with a good church. And call Oh Mr. Deacon, how uh, How's it being a deacon of this church and that passing the people? I get no rest. <laughs> I get grief. You know, that's the testimony today of a true, correct preacher, pastor, Christian of the church age. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer for if you're happy-go-lucky and the whole world loves you and everybody wants to kiss your feet and wrap their arms around you and everything's as hungry warm and ah, how great it is, you are in the wrong ministry. I learned today from two churches. I was in a church, they spoke love. We got to have love. Love that love everybody. Put some love on. I didn't forget how it was even said. And I was with a family today with our church. It was, they don't say love everybody. Look, they showed love. They gave love. Even my daughter says after a couple times, you know, this church loves us. You know, they care about us. You can say all you want. But what's your actions? And when you look at Jeremiah's ministry, you look at his counterpart, his companion, his friend, I got no rest. And if you were to ask my daughter, you say, you know, about the Hayward family ministry, you, you say, hey, Rachel, come here. What do you think about this ministry? Isn't it great and wonderful? No, they yell at us. They scream at us. They're calling the cops. Every time I see a cop when we're at the park, I know they're going to my dad. And if they don't go to my dad, I know they call the cops. And I know the cops are doing a walk by my dad, but they're there because of my dad preaching the gospel. And then my heart burns for these people because they won't listen. And I don't think Baruch is the ministry of Jeremiah either. I think it's for the fact is that Baruch looks at the people. Why ain't they listening? No one. And Baruch can absolutely say no one is listening. Now, if you go up to my daughter, you can't. She cannot say no one's listening. She can say, well, these people like us. These people are praying for it. These people support. We got one guy who support. Now, he's not a Christian, but he supports the Constitution right of free speech. But, hey, he doesn't hate us. Baruch is involved in the ministry of Jeremiah, and nobody, except for an Ethiopian eunuch, and that hasn't happened yet. So you got a ministry of frustration if you put your ministry in the world and in the people. And I find God as a testimony, if somebody comes cussing me out, screaming at me, gives me, uh, and I find a little later on that day, God will send somebody in my life, 
hey, you do whatever it is and just, okay. Baruch never got that. So that's what Baruch said. Verse 4 is God answering. Can you imagine penning that down? Can you imagine complaining of, against God? God says, hey, take a note. Okay. God's going to ask me to raise them. All right, go ahead, God. And this is what you said. Uh, really? You couldn't quote anything that I said was nice? No. Couldn't. Whatever was ever said nice about the children of Israel in the wilderness? I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. Whatever, besides the complaining, the griping. Do you realize? Well, let's go to Hebrews 11. This is a short chapter. We'll take advantage of it. Hebrews 11. I'll show you something there. Let me find where we are. Sarah. Sarah. All right. Hebrews 11.29. Picture yourself in the Old Testament. It says, By faith, the passing through the Red Sea. You remember that? Which the Egyptians are saved by to do where they drown. Remember the Red Sea cross? Everybody remembers the Red Sea cross, right? The Red Sea opened up. Israel went through. Hallelujah. Verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Everybody remembers that. That's Joshua. That's the harlot was saved. That's the that's the scarlet cloth. That's run around the city. Don't say a word. Don't blow no trumpets but on the seventh day. Verse 29, they're at the Red Sea. Verse 30, they're at Jericho. Where is any of the events of the wilderness recorded? You realize when it comes to, this is the great faith chapter, or, or application thereof. There is no great faith or no faith recorded at all between the Red Sea and Jericho. And Paul will write, I don't know if it's in Hebrews or Corinthians, they didn't enter in because, of, because they didn't have the faith. They didn't trust. Verse, chapter 45, verse 4. Thus that I'll say unto him. So, God is speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is speaking to Baruch, and Baruch is right. Baruch just finished his sentence of what he said. I don't know if he's finished, if he's still writing. Uh, okay. All right. Period. I don't know what that period is. And then the Lord says, and the Lord says thus. Now God's too speaking to Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah spoke, verse 3, what Baruch said as Baruch is writing. God is still speaking. Baruch lifts up the pen and Jeremiah turns to Baruch, thus saith the Lord. Behold. Alright, behold. That which I have built. Now, this is a message to Baruch. That which I have built will I break down. The destruction of Jerusalem and Judah has not happened yet. That which I have planted, Israel, the vine, the vineyard, I will pluck up. It has not happened yet. Even this whole land. Judah has not been put into captivity. It has not been destroyed. God says, I'm going to destroy it. You think you got grief and sorrow now, Baruch. You think you're, you're fainting and sighing now. You don't think you have enough rest now. You wait to see what's going to happen. Jeremiah is going to go to jail. And we don't know where Baruch was. But we know he, he came out of it because... He ends up in that, you know, the conspiracy theory. You know, if Baruch that told you, you know, tell us to stay here because he wants us all dead. All right, grab Jeremiah and Baruch and let's go to Egypt. Remember that? 
It's almost like God wanted us to know that Baruch was alive after the captivity and everything. To quote what's happening. But we know already what happened. We take the standpoint right now of God in Jeremiah and Baruch. So we already seen the end where they haven't. We know the city gets destroyed already. So we are taking chapter 48, we are taking on the mindset of God the Father himself. We know what Baruch said. We know what's going to happen. Because we already read it. Just five, five verses. And seekest thou great things for thyself. Whoa. Baruch wants the great. He wants the great thing. That's what God just said. There could be greater things in this. I could find a greater church. I could find a greater preacher. That's what God said. You want, you seek thou the great things for thyself. Take that note. Never mind the people. Baruch, I deserve the great. Write that down, Baruch. So we gone back almost quoting or thinking what Baruch thought. After God said, I'm going to destroy it all. Seek them not. Get your mind off it. Because it's going to be destroyed. For, behold, I, God, will bring evil upon all flesh. And we know what that evil is. Babylon comes, the Chaldeans come. And destroy. And then we know about Ishmael. And we know about Jahan. And we know about you two going to be kidnapped. Or man now. Which is a violation of the law. All flesh. That's humans and animals. Saith the Lord. So it seems like that Baruch may have his eyes on, oh, look what I see, look what I want. And God's like, nope, destruction. And we know it will burn up. And you want to see how bad it is, read uh, Nehemiah. He's, on, he's with his ass and he's walking and he gets to a point he can't even go any further. And when they're building the walls and all that, they get, they get to a point, this is too much rubbish. But thy life, Baruch, I give unto thee, and we know he survives, because he gets kidnapped, or manned And he gets charged with a conspiracy theory on that AM radio dial. For a prey in all places, whither thou goest. In other words, God says, for you, the work that you're doing, Baruch, the only reward you're going to get, you're not going to get a great spoil. You're not going to get nothing great. You're going to get, you're going to live. That's it. Now, I got here from um, Clark. For thy life will I give unto thee for a prey. This is a proverbial expression. We have met with this expression before. Jeremiah 21, 9. He that abides in the city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he that goeth out falls to the Chaldeans that besiege you. He shall live, and his life shall be unto him for a prey. Now that's God saying, listen, just give in, give up. And you're going to lose everything, but you're going to have your life as a spoil. Again, Jeremiah 38, 2, thus saith the Lord, He that remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldean shall live, and he shall have his life for a prey, and shall live. And when you go when you go into Babylon, you're not going to have nothing but yourself. You will be your own spoil. 
And now for the Ethiopian eunuch, Jeremiah 39, 18. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, you're going to live, but thy life shall be for a prey unto thee. And the Ethiopian eunuch did not die in battle. He did not die in pestilence. So, out of the, the, the Babylonian captivity and the, and the Chaldean destruction of Judah and Jerusalem, the Ethiopian eunuch and Baruch are living, and that's all they end up with. And God will give them food and clothing. That's it. A man that had his eyes set for the greatest things ended up with the littlest thing, his own life. And in the tribulation period, it's going to be even worse. Because the only way you're going to get anything is you receive the mark of the beast. And we know in the world today that people got frantic because they get, couldn't get toilet paper. You better believe they'll line up and receive that mark. To get their gasoline and get their whatever they buy. So we see the mindset of God already reading what has already happened. That Jeremiah and Baruch don't know what's happened. And we know that God knows our words and writes them now. And I want to be involved with the modern Bible because the modern Bible may have changed what Baruch said. And the Bible says, add not or subtract not from the Word of God. And I, I don't look it up, but if a modern Bible doesn't quote the King James of Jeremiah 45.3, that's not what Baruch said. And then for a man that sought great things, and I, I know there are preachers, and I know there are Christians, they want the great things. They want the greener grass. And they're not going to get the gold, silver, and precious stones. 